Um, motivation for this came from a talk that I saw at BFPG uh, back in 2013, and it was Sam talking about his experience of using uh, Haskell or New or whatever it is at the at Standard Chartered. And over there, they've got an interesting setup where they have a Visual Studio environment, and they write the New or Haskell code in that. And he observed like a range of different people trying to code in Haskell for the first time. And he saw that, I think this is what he said, so this might just be what I pretend that he actually said. <laughs> that he, uh, uh, the Possibly. people who were using the visual tools learned Haskell a lot quicker than those who didn't. So some people, I guess, could have come at it the way I might have many years ago, being a VI person where you just you know, write stuff in the next term and that's the end of it. Um, but there's a lot of the sort of you know, talk to the Haskell compiler and find things out. Uh, and so that seemed to make sense to me, so this is roughly how I thought about it. Uh, so Haskell has a great type system, it does a lot, like a really surprising amount of stuff. Programming is hard, and as far as I go, my brain is small, so this is a problem that we have to deal with. And I thought, maybe I'll run a Vim plugin that can help somehow, something, and then I'll profit. So, something that I found, um, especially like when I was trying to use yes older for the first time, is that there'd be lots of, like you'd read some code and there'd be a little symbol and it might say map in underscore and you think, what is that? Seriously, like, where does that even come from? Um, and so you might go to Google and type that in and you see, oh, it tells you this could come from the prelude, which is, where is it, here? And it sort of says, oh, maybe that's control.mono, you know, well, why is it telling me two things? Maybe it comes from data.foldable. And at least the other day when I did this, uh, Google didn't tell me about data.conduit.list, which is a thing I was actually using, which I would have liked to see. Um, and that could be my fault, I'm not really sure. But at, at any rate, if you've got a package that you built yourself that's not on package, then you know it's not going to find it. So it'd just be nice to be able to say, what is this thing at my cursor? Tell me the documentation for it. Tell me, you know, take me to some decent information about this thing. And so I thought, because I didn't realise what I was getting myself in for, that we could just use GHC mod to run the info thing on the symbol. So you start doing that, you realise that it's just not quite what you want. So if you look at map M, so this is just a normal GHC session here when you're, you know, you know, info. So you go info map M, and it says, oh, that's defined in control that one. So okay, okay, that's cool. You go info on map, and it says ghc.base. And so for the first one, you can kind of guess this URL at package.haskell.org, base, mali da da control minor. You can go there and read about it. Um, but it, like we're already doing this wrong, because at least when I did this, I had built ghc 7.8.4, so I already had you know, HTML on my laptop for that sort of thing. So, you know, we, it's not a good idea to go Googling for a Haskell module names. Um, and it sort of gets a bit worse if you look at, like, even a very simple example. Um, so if we have just a little module and we import data.list, just ignore the hiding for the moment. If we ask about, oh yeah, so if we hide map, it means we get map from the program. And then if we ask about it, it's telling us, you know, ghc.base, but there's no base package, like if you get a package, there isn't something called base dash dot something HTML. And if we ask about head, it's telling us ghc.list, but that's a bit weird because, you know, we imported data.list, that's pretty much, you know, we said we want, you know, head from that thing there. That's where it's coming from, but it's telling us about ghc.list. So, that's just how the info um, works. Um, basically, there's no page for ghc.base because it's internal. Uh, you actually want to look at the prelude. And ghc.list isn't right, as I just said, because you know, we imported data.list. So we have to do a little bit more to find whether. On, by the way, if someone actually knows the right way to do this, if I've just missed something completely, just let me know. Because as far as I know, this is the best that we can do at the moment. But it's a bit rough. Um, especially when you look at other environments like the sort of Eclipse things or the Java people who just go anything they want. So basically we've got a few bits that we have to look at. So we need to know the sort of imports that are in a module. 
are, we need to know names that are in there, like the word head. We need to know where a name was imported from, as opposed to where it was defined. Um, so when I started this, I didn't realize that that would be a distinction. Um, and then we need to kind of calculate a URL to go to call it user. So uh, this is going to be my one page introduction to the GHC API. It's basically not as bad as you might think. Um, there's no, uh, like, there's no, what is that stuff? There's this in prison, there's in classy, this, that, and the other. It's just, just pretty straightforward. So everything happens in the GHC monad, or GHC. So when you want to run it, you run the GHC, and then you just do your normal stuff after that. And it's just what you expect you have to do. So the dynamic flags are things like if you, the programmer, had said, that you've got a package directory somewhere with you know, your own like a cabal sandbox that sets that up for you. So you just set the session dynamic flags, you initialize the packages, which are things like you know, install MTL or whatever. Um, and then that little block there will load a module. So if you have tidying.hs sitting in that directory, you, I don't know why you go through this process, but you guess the target for seven and then you load all of the timings. And that will do it for you. So the, a lot of what the GHC compiler does is expose to you as this API that you can just call. And once you've got that, you can start kind of punching through the module itself. So you can ask for a module summary and based on the name line or whatever that you're trying to load. And then you can ask for whatever you want. So you can parse it, you can time check it, you can desugar it, you can get all of these things out of it. Um, and I basically just ran through most of the API until I found this thing called guts. It's, it's actually called the guts, like mod guts, meaning module guts. And it's just this thing that accumulates all of the stuff that's happened when the when the GHC API has sorry, when the GHC compiler has tried to parse and understand what the module is doing. And then I found this cool thing called the global reader environment, which is in the guts. Uh, and that thing, to me, well, it had some info about names and where names came from. Um, and pretty much the only other odd, slightly odd thing you might need to use if you're playing with this stuff is you can't just, I thought you could just you know, print GRE on its own. But it turns out you have to use the pretty printer and then use the dynamic flags because that might influence how something gets printed apparently. And then print that and then just lift it into the IO monitor. Um, so I tried that out on a small example, and it printed a billion things, but those two stuck out. So the weird IHZ and IK, whatever, that's internal um, keys for like what the GFC compilers produce for some kind of map of stuff. And I thought, oh, look, we found all we want. Because it actually says GHC.base.map was imported from the Prelude. Uh, holy crap. That's what we want. And ghc.list.head actually says imported from w.list. <coughs> right, so we're done. Not sorted it out, right? So if you have that, you can then say, like for the first one, that you should go to the hackage to Haskell the door, yada yada yada, to the prelude, and for the second one, you should go to data dash list. Uh, so it's kind of there. I think that this functionality should really be available when you go info on something. So, I mean, there's nothing really rocket science about it. It's just, it should be quite available closer to the user. Um, so that's, that's pretty much most of what I was going to show about the GHC API. Uh, for people here who might not do that much Haskell development, I was just going to mention how I found using the API, even though it's quite sparsely documented, it wasn't too hard because with Haskell, with a lovely compiler, a lovely type check that you get, you can work backwards with stuff. And I think it's probably easier if I just go to some code. Is that bigger? Yeah. So I've just become completely addicted to, uh, to using Vim with GHC mod and just looking at the types of everything and using undefined all the time and just barely writing more than a line or a word of code and then you can save and go, oh, this is a type check. And that's just you know, the way I do everything now. So 
Anyway, so I found this guts thing, and I thought, that's great, that's all we want. We have to give it something. So I've bound, binded F1 to be the type check thing. So you look down the bottom, and it just told me that D was a D-sugared module. And so I go, great, I'll give you a D-sugared module, and <coughs> say D equals undefined. So we can do that. And you know, you can save the type checks, there's no problems. So it's kind of like the whole group development that Matt did a while ago, but maybe on a simple level, I think. Yeah. You know, you know, I don't know. It's just so it's great. So then I can demonstrate my plugins. I've set F4 to go look up core modules. So if I do that, will it work? It's a good job. So core module is that thing there that gives you a mod guts. I wanted to find a So you see that and you think, oh, this thing called the sugar module takes a type check module, it's your sugar module. Brilliant. You don't even need to read the description there. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much what I just said, right? So like there is just so much stuff in this API. It goes on and on and on and on. Like it just never ends. But basically once you start finding oh, there we go. So once you start finding the bits that you need, you can just plug them together. And if it compiles, then you're happy. So anyway, so there I thought, oh, I'm going to use this function, dsugar module. I have to give it something. No, I don't know what that is. So I'll just put it on the front. And we're good. We've compiled. You know, we can go home. But then, you know, I think, oh, what's the dsugar module? Like, I'm too lazy to even go back to the web page. I'll just ask you see what it's doing. Uh, it tells me it's taking a type check module and giving me a dictionary module, so I need to give it a type check module. And I go off and I find, well, uh, type check module will do that for me. So if I put that in, and then I still don't know what to give it, so I just save, all good. And you know, you can just sort of keep on doing this, you go, oh, we need a parse module, I'll just stick that in. What do we end up? So then we look at that. That's saying mod summary, and that was the last thing on the slide. No, the, where was it? Down, down there with the mod summary. So that's kind of where you get to. And I just find that I'm using this all the time, and I can't handle looking at code that's not, like if I look at Python code, I want to put the cursor on something and go, is this type going to I just can't <laughs> handle it anymore. It's just, you know, all the time. And I, I think that I wasted a lot of time when I started Haskell not knowing that you could do this kind of thing. Because you'd look at some code, you'd think, oh god, you know, what's ask? What's that going to be? Why is what's this my thing type? It's going to be anything, right? And then you go, oh what is it? It's like, oh it's a reader T as an int in the state. And you go, oh, okay, so that means that if I look at the X, that's going to be an int. And I find that I just do this. This is basically what the talk is about, about addictive to this now. But like even little things, like I'll go, oh, I need to do a fold of something, fold L, I can never remember. You know, what are the arguments? And you go, oh, B's and A's, or what's a B, what's an A? And I'll go, I don't know, I don't know, and then there's a list. So I go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I spoke to someone about this. Was it here at BF? Yeah, it is. So I said, you know, so fold L just a second ago was B's and A's and all this stuff. Now you look at it and it's partially uh, inferred what the A has to be. So now the A is a list of child's parts of string. Uh -huh, that's pretty cool. So if I gave it a little bit more information, like I said that thing was going to be a zero, I would say. Then I say, what are you? Now it's telling me, you know, this is specifically about integers to strings and whatever. So you can kind of, you know, uh, yeah, just get so much more out of the type system just by looking at the code. You don't have to be running the thing. Or things like return, you know, it's it's obviously specific here, 
so it's going to take a string and produce this replicator. I'll try with the edge together. Okay. Let's go. Given that you're using 7.8 for 4, do you know about underscore? And yeah, the top holes? So underscore is pretty cool. So yeah. Because you can go with the underscore, and then it gets a bit angry about what the hole is, and it tells the, you. The, the bindings stuff. is the part that gets me that's the really bindings. cool, because it, it tells you kind of everything in scope. Yeah. So you can kind of go, oh, I have one of those, yeah. and fill it in. <laughs> yeah. It's just an additional benefit that I find. Yeah. I'll give you that. Although, so in that case, what do we have to do? So this has to be a function. So in this kind of case, I'd even go further and go. Yeah. So something like that. X and Y. It's not too bad. So yeah, it's wonderful. Or if you're dealing with like really big cases of stuff where you know So I looked the other day at, you know, real world Haskell and Learn You at Haskell, which are the two books that most of the newbies kind of go to. And in Learn You at Haskell, there's a single occurrence of undefined, just in the middle of some code somewhere. And in real world Haskell, it's kind of used a bit in chapter 10. I think really this, this kind of stuff should be done a bit earlier. It's, it's you know, it completely has changed the way that I code and stuff. Uh, so, yep, so that's my ad to, I guess, GHC9. Um, and to just sort of summarize what my little plugin is basically doing now, is we're using the API to partially compile or hiding or demo, whatever it was. And then we, we can pull out from the reader environment things like ghc.list.head. We then have to match that name to head using some heuristics because there's some weird things that happen, like the prelude is an implicit import, and names can kind of get overwritten by other names, I think, I'm totally sure. And then in step three, you discover that you basically go through that sort of output demand before and find the judge that list or head came from data dot list. Then I just you know call out to the shell and find the package that has this thing you find an answer and then eventually you can give you know, those two sort of URLs. But it, it, um, it does seem to work. So if I ask for what lift.io comes from, oh, on that YouTube, really? So I've never seen that before. <laughs> no, yeah. OK, that's where class one is. So yeah, that, you know, that's nice to be taken to this kind of spot straight off the bat. Uh, so because there's two spots that have some heuristics, this is how I feel about the overall process that we we found the guts, but it was a bit of a mess. Um, I think that the so the later version of GA sorry. That's brains too. Yeah. You found all sorts of things you didn't want to find. Um, so the latest version of the GHC API has uh, support for plugins, which I think means that you could be a bit more specific about keeping track of this imported from information as you go through it, uh, which was the last point there. Um, but yeah, I found it useful, like when I was playing with some yes on stuff and other things to just be able to look things up. Someone wrote an Emacs plugin, so yeah, I must be succeeding here. <laughs> um, there's some slightly weird corner cases, because I found the Haskell module system is a little bit more complicated than I expected. Um, and yeah, the GFC API wasn't too hard to use at all. The most annoying bits were giving it the correct paths to things, like if you have a Cabal sandbox, 
you need to sort of look for a directory that might be the Cabal sandbox and then pass the correct package path options and that sort of thing. But the GHC mod code has a lot of stuff that does that, so I was able to kind of steal bits from that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. The first link there is the actual utility that I wrote that does the compiling behind the scenes. That's the Vim plugin, that's David Christensen's Emacs plugin. He's the guy who works on Idris. Um, that's GHC mod, which if you do any Haskell, I don't know how you can get it done without GHC mod. Um, and just as an aside, so GHC mod is all about the file that you're looking at right there. If you make a locally correct change that breaks everything else, it's nice to use this thing called GHC ID, which keeps trying to compile your whole thing for you and very quickly tells you about errors that are sort of everywhere else. So I think with these sort of things together, you can really lift your you know, productivity. Yeah, cool. That's pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Just a quick question about the whole human uh, stuff as well. I wasn't here for that presentation. Is there much difference between what you're doing and the whole human stuff? Uh, no. About the set? Uh, it's a different, different way of actually figuring out what the types of the holes are, but it's yeah. the same kind of principles. Yeah, because yeah. the whole driven stuff's kind of from Agda, isn't it? Or, yeah. 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 So this isn't so much the whole, it's just being able to look at the types of things I find very useful. So like does anyone look up documentation like that using some other tool that I just don't know about? Have I completely missed something? What does everyone do? Do you just all Google things or? I have a few hackage pages on speed dial. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I envy about the .NET platforms is all of their documentation is available through reflection. Mm. Um, I think Python as well. Python, yeah. Can, yeah. So the Java language, Java is like there's just a separate HTML dump elsewhere, I guess, yeah. which is more similar to what you guys are dealing with in the Haskell world, and Scala, yeah. unfortunately, has copied the Java one. Yeah. Our, our documentation story is also Similarly bad. It's, yep. it's hard to piece together documentation from a bunch of different modules into a single set and integrate yep. it into ideas. So. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess if I, if you want to get into it and um, see if you can add that stuff to the to the binaries rather than to some web page somewhere, that would be kind of. Like if I had a clean slate for, for our tools, yeah. that, that's how I'd, I'd go about it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay then. Well, that was brief, but got straight to the guts of it. <laughs> <laughs>